Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Matt Bracey. I am the president of IMAPS New England. And I would like to thank you all for joining us for our very first virtual technical symposium. Um, I'd like to thank Michael Johnson and Dave Soms, who are our uh, general chairs of the technical session, who have been putting in a lot of hard work for a long time now to get this 2020 <laughs> symposium underway. And uh, if, if you want to go to the next slide, Dave, we'll continue on with that. Uh-oh, what happened? Great. <laughs> <laughs> It froze on you. Yep, it did. Now, isn't that interesting? There we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. So this is just a slide show in my face. To, uh, you can see me if I wasn't on video, but <laughs> uh, more or less, I've been serving. This is my first year as uh, president for IMAPS New England chapter. And it's an interesting year to be president. And, you know, we're going to have a, a fun, uh, fun time doing all these virtual events for everybody. But um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Dave. So for those who don't know, uh, IMAPS is the International Microelectronic Assembly and Pageant Society. Uh, we are the New England chapter of that. We're the largest chapter for IMAPS, uh, probably the most active as well. We normally run five to seven technical meetings throughout the year, and we have a large symposium that we run every May. Uh, this year was supposed to be our 47th symposium in May, and for obvious reasons, we had to postpone that. We were planning to do in October, but that is un, uh, not going to happen either. So we've gone online. So this is our first of uh, many events coming up for the symposium. Um, again, Dave and Michael have done a lot of work along with a lot of other people to get this. And uh, we're excited to see what happens. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass the microphone to Dave and uh, we'll go from there. Very good. Thank you, Matt. Greetings, everyone. My name is Dave Soms. I'd like to introduce Michael Johnson and myself. We're the general co-chairs for the symposium this year. Michael is senior principal engineer. He's a manufacturing engineer for Macom in Lowell, has 21 years with the company and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Worcester Polytech in Worcester. I have been at work for 42 years, all in the electronics thermal management business and for the last 18 of those 42 years, I've had my own consulting business. I also am the general chair for two thermal management workshops that we hold each year, one in November, so coming up pretty soon, and one that is new this year that we held in July with almost 500 participants, very successful. <clears throat> we have three events planned for this, uh, this remainder of this year, 2020. Today's is September 22nd, of course. This is our first session as a virtual session from what would have been the 2020 symposium in May. The session title is Interconnects. The session chair is Lee Levine. We'll have three technical presentations this afternoon. On October 27, we have a chapter technical meeting. Eric Perfecto, uh, who is an IEEE fellow and a senior packaging engineer now working on heterogeneous integration and in artificial intelligence at IBM Research will be the presenter. That should be a very interesting presentation. He is working currently at the newest IBM Research Lab facility, which is at CNSC in uh, Albany, New York, immediately adjacent to the University at Albany campus. And then on November 5, we have the second of these virtual symposium sessions, just like today's event. The topic will be RF and microwave. Tom Terlizzi from Agile Microwave Technology Incorporated will be the session chair and we'll have three presentations in that November 5 presentation. Since we had quite a number of RF microwave presentations for the symposium, it's very likely that we will have a second of these virtual symposium sessions after the turn of the year that will also be an RF microwave uh, topic session. In terms of logistics for today's, this afternoon's event, what we will do is we will have the presenters presenting live. Uh, we will have a Q&A session that will follow each presentation. There is a chat box function for Zoom. If you've found that and opened it, you can type in questions. I would suggest choose everyone's the destination. That, ev that way everybody can see the question uh, and it won't get hung up in case there's a problem with uh, the moderator finding the various questions. 
The chat box function allows you to write a short question. Please do keep it fairly short. Michael Johnson, my co-chair, will be working to uh, accumulate the questions and then we'll, at the end of the speaker's presentation time, we'll have 10 minutes for going through the various questions and answers. Uh, you should also uh, receive an email at a later date from IMAPS New England that will have information about the presenter's slide sets and how to access those. <clears throat> We're expecting to conclude this afternoon at just about 3.05 this afternoon, uh, following all of the, uh, the presenters, the Q&A sessions, and the comments at the very end. Uh, Matt, as moderator, will turn off everyone's microphones except the speaker uh, once the speaker is ready to begin the presentation. That's just to keep a background noise at a, a dull roar. I'd like to introduce Lee Levine. He will be our session chair for this session, Interconnects. Lee has been a past general chair for the IMAPS New England Symposium for several years. He has a consulting business of his own, Process Solutions Consulting in Trip, New Tripoli, Pennsylvania, and he's the primary, the principal consultant. His consultation work uh, focuses on training and consultation for wire bonding, uh, scanning my microscopy with EDS for failure analysis, statistical analysis with DOE. He has spent 20 years as a senior staff metallurgist for Helix and Safa, and he had uh, four patents while he was with KNS and approximately 70 technical papers. Bachelor's degree in engineering, metallurgy and material science from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And he has been awarded two of the highest recognitions within IMAPS as a society, the Daniel Hughes Award and the John Wagnon Award for his contributions to the industry. So we're pleased to have Lee as the session chair he will also be one of our speakers. We will roll right into our first uh, presentation now. This will be given by Terence York. Terry is the Regional Product Manager for the Americas for Kiliki and Safa Industries. The title of his presentation is High Accuracy Pick and Place Interconnection. And this will start, looks like we'll start just a couple of minutes early, but uh, let me give you the introductory, uh, the short biography for Terry. He is currently the regional product manager for Kiyoki and Safa, KNS. He's graduated from Georgia Tech in Atlanta with a BSME in 1997, started immediately with Philips EMT in the same year as a product engineer. He then moved over to the applications engineering group in 2000 and product management in 2009 for KNS. He is responsible for translating market customer requirements for the Americas region of the Electronics Assembly and Advanced Packaging Business Unit within KNS. Main focus for him is the delivery of, of competitive solutions to further expand KNS's success with assembly and advanced packaging markets across the Americas. I've included his email here if you want to make a note of that. If you have uh, questions you want to ask Terry separately following his presentation and when we're finished today. Uh, with that, let's uh, let's begin. I am going to uh, stop screen sharing, and then uh, Terry, you should be able to put up your slide set. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks to IMAPS for allowing me to uh, present, and and thanks for everyone for uh, for joining. Let me see here. I'm hoping you guys can see my presentation, at least the first page. Yes, can you bring it up to full screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. great, Just thanks. wanted to make sure. Okay, yeah, thanks again, Dave, for the introduction. Um, yeah, when you guys think of Kulik and Sofa or KNS, you uh, probably most likely think of ball bonder or wire bonder, but we do have other business units. Uh, within KNS, and my focus, as Dave mentioned, is uh, EA, which we call electronics assembly, or similar to uh, surface mount technology, as well as also a focus in uh, advanced packaging. Uh, the MR for for KNS term stands for mass reflow, uh, but it is the ad advanced packaging group. Um, I'd like to uh, talk today about a topic. Um, mainly concerned with machine flexibility. 
um, and the transition from uh, advanced packaging R&D or MPI type of mode to uh, an automated type of assembly mode uh, and then flexibility within that uh, you know machine topic and um, I've kind of highlighted advanced packaging all the way to odd form placement so a uh, very wide spectrum uh, topic and then focusing on uh, uh, KNS iFlex uh, H1 for a single machine type of uh, solution to this type of uh, challenge. So to start out, um, I'm sure we're all very well aware of uh, the, the trends in not only EA, but advanced packaging, uh, and then just electronics uh, assembly uh, in general, right? All uh, new products are more intelligent. Uh, everything is becoming connected uh, via internet or IoT. Uh, and then everything else is also uh, focused on energy savings. So these packages, packages and, and assemblies become more uh, advanced uh, and more complicated um, as, we, as we trend into the future. And some of the challenges we see, um, you know, again, from let's say an R&D or a, an MPI or new product introduction type of environment, and then transitioning to automated assembly. Uh, some of the challenges uh, with that, also low-level advanced assembly to automated assembly. Uh, some of the challenges, number one, is high equipment cost, right? Uh, how do you limit that uh, initial capital expenditure when moving from a manual type of assembly to a fully automated assembly, or at least somewhat automated assembly? Um, also, what are the equipment capabilities, and are you uh, purchasing equipment that you're underutilizing or unusing uh, specific cap capabilities of the equipment. You know, focus is on accuracy. You know, what's the, what's the uh, packaging requirement? Is it five micron? Is it 10 micron? Is it 25 micron? Um, so that's one of the first challenges. Um, you don't want to pay for something that uh, you necessarily don't get a return on investment on. And then you want to start looking at throughput. You know, how much uh, output do you need or, or units per hour is required based on this move to uh, automated assembly? Is it 3,000 uh, units per hour? Is it 5,000? Is it greater? You start moving into different uh, realms of, of production. Also, packaging uh, becomes a factor. Um, usually, we, we see in these low-level uh, advanced assembly markets, uh, waffle pack. Sometimes we see wafer. Sometimes we see even in, in, in short strip tape or tape and reel uh, or even bulk. Um, and then as you move into more of a hybrid type of assembly, um, you start seeing an introduction of SMT type of components within a, the advanced packaging uh, assembly. Also, you may see the use of FR4 as substrate versus um, you know, a traditional uh, substrate mm -hmm. as well. So those are all all challenges that need to be uh, looked at and then also um, used to uh, help procure the uh, equipment. Uh, so I started talking about machine flexibility and, and transitioning from that R&D towards an automated type of assembly. And I can all highlight the KNS um, platform, uh, iFlex H1. Um, you want to start looking at, you know, comparative cost. So this is the initial uh, capital equipment cost. You know, this uh, type of single machine solution is very low cost when you compare it to, let's say, a traditional die attached solution. Um, very low initial cost, also a low cost of ownership or CEO, and then a very high first pass yield, which also uh, factors into uh, cost relationship. Some of the capabilities, high level uh, capability. It's a 20 micron uh, CPK greater than 1.0 accuracy machine. So that goes back to the previous slide. You know, do you need five micron? Do you need seven? Do you need 10? Do you need 20, 25? Those are factors that you have to look into and, and address. Um, the throughput, 7.5K, uh, 7,500 UPH per hour. That's an IPC 9850 rating. So that uh, comes directly from the uh, SMT 
uh, world, but it's a standard based on uh, throughput. And then a very wide component range. So an 0201 uh, case size, which is roughly 600 uh, by 300 uh, micron. And then all the way up to 120 by 52 millimeters um, in length and width, and then a 50 millimeter height, uh, maximum height of component. When we look at packaging, uh, fully waffle pack capable uh, with a, a very unique automated uh, type of tray slash pallet uh, automated exchange system. And then looking at hybrid assembly, uh, you know, you're, you're combining different types of uh, uh, techniques, die attach, SMT, and then all the way to odd form. Um, that's pretty much a, let's say an all in one single machine solution. I mentioned the uh, automated uh, assembly uh, or, or waffle pack handling. So this is a very unique um, tray exchange system uh, to the market. So fully automated, uh, can hold greater than 150 uh, waffle pack, so multiple part numbers. Um, you can use common setup, uh, which means no manual exchange. So basically, you set up the tray exchange system, and then you pretty much leave it uh, as is. So there's no manual intervention or, or manual, manual changing of, uh, of anything within the exchange system once you have it set up. That's a very unique cache system. So the waffle pack or the material being used in a particular recipe uh, is moved into a cache. Uh, instead of uh, traveling from, let's say, bottom of tray exchange to top or uh, pick position or, or presentation to the machine. Very minimal forces and accelerations applied, um, and those are user configurable as well as minimal vibration. So uh, the smaller the, the, the die become or the, the component, the more tendency to flip or, or jostle within some type of automated uh, exchange system. Uh, so we've addressed all of those issues as well. And then again, the 20 micron uh, CPK greater than one, 7,500 uh, UPH. We start looking at packaging uh, as well as hybrid assembly or, or hybrid type of production. Uh, most common in SMT is, is, uh, is tape and reel. Um, but in advanced packaging, we see everything from bulk, um, bowl feeder. Uh, we can also see in some uh, uh, markets stack tube, which are uh, connectors and then labels as well. When we talk about hybrid assembly and, and stacking and uh, package on package, um, there's solutions for flux or adhesive capability. So uh, it's basically a linear flux unit where you're dipping, uh, whether it's uh, a die or flip chip or some other type of component before placement. And then of course, uh, vacuum generated nozzle um, holding capability and as well as gripper or mechanical type of um, component handling. With odd form, a uh, very different uh, arena, very focused within uh, industrial type of applications, um, uh, as well as power supply and, and even automotive. Uh, but you see quite a bit uh, large, unusual uh, connectors. Bulk could be fed bulk, um, and then designing bowl feeder uh, around that type of uh, component. Stack tube I mentioned in the previous slide, and, and you can see in the, in the upper right, an actual gripper assembly, uh, which in some cases, the, the component's not able to be held with some type of, so let's say, standard vacuum nozzle. So we have to use uh, gripper uh, functionality. And then the, the component height, uh, 50 millimeter maximum component height, uh, which is a 50 over 50, uh, which is extreme uh, flexibility. Placement force of, of 80 Newton. So some of these connectors or, or odd type of components need to be press fit um, or, or snap fit into the uh, actual uh, substrate. 
And then also it's a, a re reduction of manual labor. A lot of times we see these optimal parts are basically hand stuffed uh, by hand. So uh, you, you see a hand stuffing line. And if you look at the R&D or the MPI side, yeah, 100% you're actually manually placing that type of part. And I do have a video of actual machine and operation. Hopefully this comes through. But you can see two things. You can see the, the tray exchange, the automated uh, exchange system, as well as the odd form capability uh, with, with connector placement. And there are exchange systems, so you're not limited to, well, let's say, one gripper or one nozzle. So you're able to exchange. Run that again. It's fairly short. And the tallest connector in this actual, this uh, short video is 50 millimeters uh, tall. So you can kind of, kind of get a comparison. And another factor within uh, flexibility, I, I think the hot term in the last uh, couple of years and, and all these trade shows and in the market in general is smart factory or industry 4.0. Uh, you hear several terms for this, but basically it's the, 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 the interconnecting of, of everything within you know, your, your factory down to the machine level or the material registration level. So basically it's the trend started within the consumer electronics industry for IOT of inter or internet of things. So, everything being connected. So your refrigerator, your oven, uh, your, your doorbell device. So that's what's driving uh, the smart factory uh, type of slogan or industry 4.0. Um, a little bit different for the normal SMT uh, type of realm or the EA is sex gem, uh, which is very common in the advanced packaging uh, or wafer fab type of environment. So that's something that uh, traditionally came from uh, the KNS side. Um, uh, the H1 is fully sex gem compatible, uh, fully factory ready interface, strip mapping, host communication. So start, stop, recipe type of uh, commands uh, via sex gem, which is uncommon in the SMT world, but very common in let's say the ball bonder uh, type of uh, environment. CAMX, which is more traditional, uh, form of communication in SMT. Uh, it's via SOAP interface, uh, XML, uh, format messaging. Uh, one of the standards is OML. That's uh, from Mentor Graphics. Um, and this is how uh, we're taking and in, in interpreting the performance and traceability data and reporting them from a, a common machine type of language. So continuing with a smart factory uh, theme, uh, we also have VIOT, which is uh, a performance and traceability monitoring. This is a real-time um, uh, factory reporting. You can you can drill down to different levels of granularity. If you if it's a global operation, you can drill down to a particular factory, a particular line, uh, a particular machine within that line, and then determine. Uh, um, many different uh, efficiency ratings, how the machine is performing, different types of error modes, why is the machine uh, not performing, uh, and then you can link that to the uh, local site um, uh, to help uh, remedy the situation. Uh, performance monitoring, uh, I mentioned real time. So you can see these type of events on, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, your, your phone or some other type of device or at your desk, uh, you can look at a different factory in a different region of the world and drill down, uh, just like I had mentioned. Also historical reporting. So not just real time, but historical. So you can go back in time and then start looking at um, uh, data tables and, and look at, at uh, efficiency or improvements and, and see if, if changes have, have taken and made an improvement in production. Also key is traceability. Uh, so the ability to uh, figure out what component was placed on, on what product um, in case 
there's some type of issue in the field. Uh, we can address lot level traceability as well as all the way down to reference designator uh, level traceability, which is exactly the, the single component on any single uh, uh, circuit or product produced. CFX is uh, somewhat new. It's an, again, another uh, machine language. Uh, it's adopted by uh, the IPC, which is uh, an SMT um, word. It's open standard uh, development kits. Uh, so um, the, the suppliers have full access. Many of the uh, SMT suppliers have already signed up uh, for the CFX standard. And basically it's the, the machine to factory, factory to machine, machine to machine communication, plus events that are then logged within the MES uh, type of system or logistical side of, of the system. Sorry for all the acronyms, but yeah, that's, that's the M to F and the F to M, but basically communication from whether it's factory or machine. And then again, this, this carries the, the same type of information uh, as CAMEX or, or even SexGem, but it's the performance and the traceability reporting, work orders and even you know, some material management. And again, this is uh, Hermes, which is uh, basically the new worldwide industrial IoT type of uh, communication. Uh, currently today, uh, we uh, focus around SMEMA, which is simply a, an IO type of machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, basically ready busy signal, uh, allowing product to move from, let's say one piece of equipment to, to the next. Uh, and this Hermes uh, machine protocol or, or data protocol will eventually replace uh, SMEMA. Uh, and it's one of the key enablers of the industry 4.0 or these uh, smart factory or digital factory solutions. And uh, the format is TCP IP, as well as XML uh, messaging from machine to machine. And there's a much more data that's able to be transferred uh, between machine to machine uh, when using Hermes. So, uh, strip information, uh, bad mark information, product information, recipe information. So these machines can do automated uh, uh, changeover based on the information coming from the Hermes protocol. Where in SMEMA, that's uh, 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 absolutely not available to do uh, through SMEMA. Another big thing, uh, we've had this for quite a few years now, uh, but uh, with the with the COVID-19 situation, uh, this has become probably one of our, our most popular, uh, um, let's say internet tools is remote service. Uh, so we're able to uh, log on directly to our customer uh, machines. Of course, they have to give us uh, the ability to do that and uh, approval to do that. Uh, but what we found is uh, we're solving more issues uh, in a faster uh, realm through remote diagnostics uh, versus let's say traditional technical support over the phone. Um, and from the data that we've logged, let's say in the, within the last year, we're able to solve you know pretty much 80% of all issues we can solve via this way, this remote connection uh, versus let's say a technical support or even even worse, having to send someone on site. So that's uh, a big uh, help in, in solving some of these issues in the, in the field. And not only that, but then preventing from uh, sending an engineer on site um, or, or something similar. Also, when we talk about flexibility, it's, it's low cost of uh, ownership, right? You want, you want a low cost and you want a high value for um, uh, your, your solution that you've chosen. Um, with the, the H1, you have uh, less than 35 hours. Oops, let's see if I can go back, sorry. Less than 35 total hours of uh, PM or preventive maintenance per year a very low number of uh, spare parts. And we also have extended uh, warranty options. Standard is one year, but we can also do uh, different uh, uh, solutions as far as uh, warranty. 
another KPI or a, a performance indicator for most customers is energy consumption. You know, trying to 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 have a green footprint. Um, so we use Maturi systems. So no vacuum pump needed, uh, no house vacuum needed. Uh, we use uh, Venturis throughout the entire machine. And uh, what's key is here, they're only active when you're, when you're holding a component. So if the machine is in some type of, let's say, steady state, uh, we're not actively using compressed air to uh, create vacuum through the Venturi. And then the, the use of linear motors, a far more efficient motor, um, uh, both X, Y, and the Z axis. You can see some energy consumption values for some of the, the products. Another key is, is small footprint, uh, small footprint and reliability. So you may not think about this, but uh, in these type of environments for R&D and, and MPI type of uh, uh, assembly uh, manufacturing sites, you know, footprint is very key. You, you, you have a, uh, you know, a fixed landscape or uh, you know, area that you're able to uh, utilize. Uh, so very key in R&D. Uh, it's also key uh, within the clean room environment. You know, clean room uh, environments are not cheap. They're very expensive. And the larger they are, the more expensive they become. So uh, you, wanna, you wanna minimize your um, footprint uh, in a clean room environment as well. And then reliability, so very high uptime, uh, you know, machine availability, 99.99%, um, uh, extremely high, high pickup rate, which is uh, greater than 99.97%. Uh, and then low defect rate, so uh, we're specking less than one DPM, so uh, that's defect per million parts placed. So every million parts placed, we would expect uh, only one defect uh, within spec. Also key are some uh, flexibility tools um, on the uh, programming side or first article. So this is your, your first article uh, product. So on the offline programming side or, or let's say recipe generation side, we have several tools um, to uh, help with, a, let's say, a zero waste type of environment. Uh, the first is on the offline side, what we call virtual sticky tape. So it's basically running our first article uh, in an offline type of environment. We're, we're confirming the, the feeder orientation, uh, confirming the packaging or the presentation of the materials and the orientations. We're also confirming the package, package itself, the shape, the pattern of the, the package itself. And then confirming the uh, placement orientation. So if you can see in the, the top right uh, corner, you can see some images. You can see land pattern versus uh, the actual part pattern. And then correcting um, and adjusting uh, to make sure that it is the correct orientation, is the correct shape or correct package. Um, and that's done all offline. We also have a second check, which is on the machine. So it's basically like a, a first article check uh, on the machine. We, we call MPI mode uh, or teach place. And basically you could uh, step through the entire bomb. So you can step through the entire uh, recipe or you can step through certain, certain things within that recipe that's configurable. And then similar to the offline uh, first article, you're confirming, you're confirming uh, theta, you're confirming X, Y uh, location or centroid. And you're also confirming the actual shape um, uh, that the machine is expecting to see uh, and comparing it to the actual product or the substrate, uh, whether it's FR4, uh, you're, you're matching that land pattern to the actual uh, substrate uh, or land pattern on the actual product. So all that equals basically no loss of material. So we're able to do that without placing a single uh, device. So zero waste. Also another key is uh, intuitive or operator guided changeover. So changeover in an automated uh, type of environment is basically downtime. So trying to lessen the, uh, the amount of downtime. Uh, so uh, the machine itself gives guidance to the user or the operator 
to help uh, decrease the amount of dying, downtime. Um, it helps decrease complexity and then improve the ease of use. Uh, improves the accuracy or limit the chance of error after a changeover. And then we're also confirming materials during at the same time frame. Uh, we use Feeder Anywhere, which you can see in the top uh, right. Basically, the, the, the machine is intelligent enough to know where a particular feeder and part number are, and then create a recipe based on where it's positioned physically uh, on the machine itself. And then in addition, we have alternate feeding. So if that particular uh, feeder runs out of material, we will switch to uh, another feeder located on the machine with that same uh, type of material. You have also feeder verification. So you can see in the middle picture, uh, basically scanning uh, a barcode uh, on a reel, and then all that information is then stored in a, in a, a data um, type of cell to not only use for traceability, but also to confirm uh, positioning of feeders, parts uh, for recipe generation. Uh, reel verification, also we can do material control, uh, a lot of focus on AVL, MSD, uh, Rojas, and then even unique real ID, which is the highest uh, form of traceability. How do we do that? Well, we use uh, some of the features on the machine itself. So you can see in the pictures in the bottom right corner, you know, we use LEDs uh, to kind of guide the operator, not only with the user interface, but the feeders themselves. So green is good, of course. Orange, yes, that part is required, but it may need to be moved. And then red, of course, needs to be uh, moved somewhere else. And then even the trolley itself, we have LEDs on the trolleys to help, again, guide the, the, the operator or the user. You know, the, the feeder should be inserted at this particular position, so we, we light up that particular position, make it very easy uh, for the user to uh, understand. And then just in conclusion, uh, you know, the, the transitioning from an R&D type of environment or a, uh, an MPI type of environment, uh, moving towards automated assembly. Uh, with the H1, it's a the full spectrum of application capabilities, right? Targeting the customer. Whether it's advanced packaging, advanced assembly, or, or hybrid, you know, all the way to an odd form type of uh, assembly, you know, the, the capabilities are there to do any uh, any one of those applications. Low cost, right? Not only just the initial investment, uh, but the cost of operation after, uh, let's say the first year, the, the small footprint and the link towards um, the uh, clean room environment or the actual energy savings. And then looking at the capabilities, it's a 20 micron machine, uh, depending on the requirements of his die attach, right? 20 microns is, is very good. The, the ball bonder or the wire bonder will take care of the rest. Uh, the UPH 7,500, fully smart factory ready. We went over that as well. Reliability, extremely reliable, reliable machine. And then quite a bit of uh, first article tools to help on uh, a zero waste type of environment when you're introducing new products. And then just the ease of use, uh, you know, guiding the operator to you know, what they wanna do next and helping them along the way and, and trying to create an environment where the, there's the least amount of uh, downtime. And that's, that's it. Hopefully you guys have some questions. Thank you, Terry. That was a great chat. Um, we did have a question come through um, for our audience. Could you explain more in terms of um, when you reference recipe changeover, what that entails? Yeah, hold on. Let me see if I can go back to the same. OK, sorry. What, what, what was the, the uh, question? The uh, question was um, if you can explain in like more detail what does it mean for recipe changeover for our audience? Yeah, basically a recipe uh, in our terms is what the, the machine or the piece of equipment is supposed to do based on product design. So uh, the recipe tells uh, the machine, uh, you must place these components in these uh, locations uh, at this specific time. And where do you uh, pick those components from? So basically it's, 
it's a, a program we call it recipe on telling the, the the machine what to do when to do it and how to do it and then the end result is a, a completed product great um, just a reminder to um, everyone listening um, if you have any questions type them in the chat box and we'll feed them to Terry. Um, while we give others time, I had one other question, um, component size. You mentioned, I think, um, smallest you were looking at was 0201 on the machine. Have you looked into where the industry is driving to smaller S&T components, 0105, or even now smaller than that? Um, looked at incorporating that either on this machine or other machines? This machine, yeah, this machine would, would stop at the 0201. Basically, there's two steps down from this 0201 size. So the, the, the latest and, and smallest component uh, in the market and in, in the SMT market today, we call 0201 metric or 008004. And basically, that size is uh, 250 micron by 125 micron. So that's the smallest component on the market uh, currently. And we do have other machines, other uh, platforms that uh, can handle that component, not this specific uh, H1 platform, but we do have other equipment that supports that uh, latest smallest component size. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, is the machine capable of dispensing epoxy for the die attach process or does that need to be done upstream? It, you know, yeah, we can, we can, let's say, well, we can't actually dispense, but what we use is a dispensing unit. So basically we would take the component and then dip uh, into a flux bath or an adhesive bath before aligning and placing. So yeah, no, we don't dispense, but yes, we can do other types of uh, what we call dip fluxing. Um, to do the same result, right? Or you can always do it with a piece of equipment um, upstream from the pick and place tool, whether it's stencil or, or you can also do, of course, just a dispense unit. Great. Okay, um, not seeing any other questions coming through from the audience. Um, Dave, do you have any other questions for Terry or? I had added one more. You'd mentioned, Terry, the AVL. Uh, are you saying the machine is capable of matching a given component or material part number to a preloaded AVL list? Yes, that's correct. So uh, we keep a database based on the material registration. Uh, and when we look at the particular reel that's being scanned, then we go back and look at the database and link that database to make sure that it is an AVL type of uh, component or AVL approved uh, component. If it's not, then the machine will just go into an error mode and will not allow a uh, product to be built. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Great. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Again, uh, Terry, thank you for your presentation. As, uh, Definitely good to see uh, the new, new equipment out there. Uh, yeah, um, no, thank you. Yes, Dave, I'll pass it back to you to move on to the next speaker. Terry, thank you very much for the presentation. Much appreciated. Our next speaker will be Lee Levine. And Lee is, as mentioned, the session chair for this session for the symposium on Interconnect. Uh, Lee is a principal consultant with Process Solutions Consulting in New Tripoli, Pennsylvania. I already gave uh, uh, his short bio, but I'll just run through it again. Uh, he is doing consulting work and training on wire bonding, SEM with EDS for failure analysis and also statistical analysis with DOE. He spent 20 years with KNS as a senior staff metallurgist. He had four patents awarded and 70 technical papers written. Originally, he had a BS in engineering from Lehigh University in metallurgy and materials science. Lehigh is in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Lee has been awarded the Daniel Hughes Award and the John Wagner Award, excuse me, for his technical contributions by the society. Uh, IMAPS, just as a side note, used to hold a, an optoelectronics workshop 
in downtown Bethlehem every year. And we had a couple of times an opportunity during that workshop to visit Lehigh for a couple of their labs and also their SEM area. Lee's presentation will be titled Wire Bonding, Ultrasonic Bonding Mechanism. And I will stop sharing and Lee, you are on deck, right? Need Matt to unmute Lee. Okay, now I might be live. Sounds good. Wire bonding is a welding process. It forms an intermetallic weld nugget. Ultrasonic output, the amplitude is the most important process variable. Failure of the weld nugget interface is the most important wire bond failure mode. Failure at elevated temperature resulted, resulting from Kirkendall voids and that is a differential diffusion, is most common for gold aluminum. Copper aluminum is susceptible to corrosion and oxidation. Well-made copper aluminum bonds properly encapsulated in a low ion content encapsulant should be more reliable than gold aluminum bonds, especially at high temperature. Wire bonding is still the dominant chip interconnect method. 78% most recent uh, number I've had and remains the least expensive interconnect. And that, that cost is really important because cost drives our industry. Wire bonding continues to grow. It's not growing as fast as flip chip and advanced packaging, but it's still growing and, and wire bonding packages are growing. New develops, new developments, copper and silver wire, area array wire bonding, multi-layer wire bonding, offline programming, continue to provide additional capabilities. And thank you. Thank you, Lee, for the uh, talk. Um, for everyone, um, for uh, not seeing any uh, questions coming through on the chat box, so I'll just remind everyone that we will be providing contacts for our speakers should you have a question. Um, actually, uh, do we have time, Dave, for one question that came through? No, we're four minutes over time. We need to, uh, I think we need to move. Okay. Uh, so we will relay that to Lee um, later on and try to get it back, back an answer to you. Lee, can you stop screen sharing, please? Oh, sure. I'm sorry, everybody, for the screw up that I had. Quite all right. We always learn as we go here, and it's not just embedded videos. Maybe it's now uh, we don't try to use, uh, don't try to automate our presentations either. Our third and final speaker will be Tom Green. Tom is a consultant uh, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The title of his presentation will be Silver Epoxy Turns Black after an epoxy, after an, excuse me, an oxygen plasma clean prior to wire bonding. So what? Tom has uh, 39 years of industry, academic, and DOD experience combined, including uh, curriculum development and industry teaching for packaging and assembly processes for industry professionals. He's a research, when he was a research scientist at RADC, the United States Air Force Rome Air Development Command Center outside of Rome. Tom worked as a reliability engineer analyzing avionics equipment and uh, avionics component failures. As senior process engineer with Lockheed Martin Astronautics in Denver, Tom was responsible for materials and processes for military and aer aerospace hybrid packaging, gained invaluable experience in wire bond, die attach, substrate fabrication, hermetic sealing, and leak testing. Over the last 15 years, Tom has been using his expertise and has positioned his company as a recognized industry leader in teaching and consulting for high rel military, aerospace, and medical device applications. Tom is also an IMAP Society Fellow, and I've included his email address here uh, if you want to uh, contact him directly. So I will stop sharing. Tom, are you ready to go? Yep. Then I will stop sharing.
Lee, thank you again. And Tom, let's roll. Okay. All right, so you can see my screen okay. Hold on, give me a second. You see that okay? So Dave? far so good. Okay. Full screen, yep. Okay. Great. All right, well, let me just move something out of the way here. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that introduction, Dave, and uh, uh, kudos to, um, to you and, and Matt and Michael and Lee, Harvey, Judy, the whole New England uh, IMAPS. I don't know, uh, one thing you forgot to tell everyone up front is uh, it's an all volunteer organization. And I think you do a tremendous job every year putting on these uh, events and I look forward to getting back to the live ones. So, um, okay, so like the title suggests, uh, silver epoxy turns black um, after an oxygen plasma treatment. So what? That was a question I asked myself back in the late 80s as a new process engineer with, um, with Martin Marietta out in Denver at the time, because we had a UV ozone cleaner. And I noticed every time I put it in there, it was easy to wire mod. Uh, but we weren't allowed to use it. The, quality engineer said, can't use that because the customer doesn't like it, it turns black. And I would always say, so what? We're gonna put a lid on it and shoot it up into space. <laughs> it's not like he has to look at it. So I've always wondered about this and over the years, um, I've been fortunate enough to go in and out of a lot of um, hybrid facilities. And I noticed that by and large, you know, especially in the mill uh, hybrid business, um, large microwave modules, um, people are reluctant to use a oxygen uh, plasma treatment. And so what I'm gonna do is just walk you through um, why I think maybe uh, process engineers should look at that because I, I think it's a, a big uh, reason behind reworks. And reworks uh, more than anything and that whole rework process is the Achilles heel for hybrid manufacturing. So whether it's wire reworks or, you know, removing and replacing a chip because you beat up the bond pads, um, whatever it is, and especially when you're dealing with gold on gold wire bonding, you really need a uh, pristine interface to get the wires to stick well. So, um, this is a brief outline of my talk. I just want to kind of alert you to the to the issues in 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 hybrids. It's it's really um, a tough gig when it comes to wire bonding, uh, and then this rework cycle. It's, it's sometimes they call that the hidden factory. It's a hard thing to keep track of, but it slows down the schedule and and uh, results in reliability issues and schedule delays and really a lot of lost profit for the uh, for the company and um, uh, bleed out this is a problem that's been around for a long time resin bleed i'm going to talk about what causes that and then you know uh what what to do and what, one thing you can do is inspect for it there's some new technology that's coming to the market i refer to it as the blue light special I'll get into that and I'll touch on some of the mill requirements for resin bleed. Um, and then uh, plasma cleaning, we all do it, but uh, primarily it's an argon treatment. And uh, what I'm suggesting with this talk is that uh, maybe you look at um, oxygen, a good oxygen plasma treatment and, um, you know, get over the fact that uh, the epoxy turns black. I think uh, O2 plasma has been uh, kind of bum wrap over the years and, and I see it as a way to really uh, improve process yields and, and more importantly improve, improve the, uh, the reliability of hardware that goes into uh, the military and, and uh, space assets. So um, what you're looking at here is a uh, hybrid one each chip and wire hybrid. 
That's what the industry was founded on. Now there's a lot of challenges in wire bonding uh, in this device and hybrids by and large are very difficult to fully automate um, with a wire bonding process. Now, some companies, BAE being one of them, you know, end up automatically wire bonding a lot of the uh, components in here. But it's a challenge because you have different heights, different metallurgies involved, you're bonding to a pin, you're bonding down to thick film. Thick film always has a little saddle in it, so the stitches tend to pop up. Um, then you have your, your chip here. Um, so it's, it's a tough gig, and some of these pins are, are actually rounded. Okay, now um, RF microwave modules, RF mimic modules, uh, MIC hybrids as they used to call them. Uh, these are especially uh, difficult. And for starters, most of the wire binding that goes on in these kind of devices is all gold on gold. It's, um, you know, ribbon or, or uh, wedge bonds for the RF inputs and then ball bonding the DC inputs. And the trace is either a, uh, a hard ceramic, which if nicely plated is pretty easy to stick to. But then we have these uh, Teflon boards, soft Teflon boards. And if they are not absolutely pristine from a cleanliness standpoint, you're not going to get the wire to stick. And so what happens is operators tend to turn up the power to get them to stick. That creates heel cracks. Or I'll get into some of the other issues there. But uh, the other aspect here with um, microwave modules is, is access. So we have uh, deep access concerns. And we have these real tiny mimic chips where really on a gate pad, you get one, one shot at. Okay, so we're all familiar with, uh, with ball bonding. Getting a ball to stick up on a mimic is usually pretty straightforward, but the stitch, when you go down onto the substrate or to a pin or, you know, um, uh, maybe even off a capacitor or a soft board, you really have to be dialed in from a wire bonder's perspective. And a big part of that is the cleanliness. You know, in wire bonding, the theory of metals, um, you just put two uh, gold plates next to each other without any contaminants. Of course, gold doesn't oxidize. They're going to stick together. You know, when it's a pristine, clean surface and you're hitting fat, fat, not fat, you're hitting flat, your bond window is pretty wide open. So that's really the trick is, is cleaning and cleaning well. And as I get into this, uh, resin, because the a resin bleed out, you can't always see it. So that, that's kind of the problem. And then of course, ribbon's very popular. Ribbon, ball bonding, soft boards. Um, and this right here is probably the most challenging uh, wire bond application out there, if you ask me. That is a deep access 7 tenths gold wedge with a heated tip. And you're going to go to a gate pad. This is a dual fat. Some of these gate pads are only two by two mils. So that's like 50 by 50 microns. So you really get one shot at it. And then on the other end, you're going to bring it down to a Teflon board. So you're probably familiar with the Rogers materials and other people make them, but Teflon is loaded with ceramic. So, you know, if you get a version in there, that's, doesn't have a lot of ceramic, lower dielectric constants, can be much softer. And if you heat it, that makes it even worse. And some boards get soldered in place. So you can't just put it through a board washer and expect it to be clean enough. So uh, what really works, in my opinion, is the uh, an oxygen plasma treatment. Um, and then I see this all the time going to hybrid companies. I know right away looking at the device, if they're over bonding, more than likely it's because of contaminants that are on the surface. 
So here's a heel crack in an eight tenths gold wedge bond. So there's two things that really frighten people in the space community, and that's launching a heel crack, because that may get through screen tests. You know, but you're looking 10, 20 year mission lives, that's not gonna cut it. And the reverse of that is when you see a wire bond that looks great, but isn't really connected. And if you worked around, you know, doing 100% non-destruct or you don't have good controls, that's a potential lift. Um, here's another example of that. Now this isn't resin bleed, but silicones, by the way, also very uh, dangerous to have around a, a wire bond. This is an old lithium niobate modulator where just looking at the bonding, nothing was sticking. So they just kept pounding away at it. Um, so anyway, um, if you, your wire doesn't stick or you overbond it and it cracks, you gotta rework the wire. If you beat up the IC enough, now you gotta rework the, uh, the IC or the memory. So there's just looking into any old hybrid, you gotta get a tool in there. So I'm gonna go through the rework cycle for a chip, just very briefly. Here's an IC back here with some silver epoxy. So if second bond doesn't stick, or I beat up the bond pads on the chip, I gotta replace that. How do I do that? I come in with a tool and heat up the uh, chip. And there's companies like Midas, um, Bruce Wilson, I, I think is still with them. They, um, they can give you uh, some equipment to do this or you just heat up the whole unit or locally heat it up. And then you gotta soften it up. You gotta get above the glass transition temperature of the epoxy, get in there with a tool and dig it out. So when that happens, you may shatter the chip, you got loose pieces of wire, and you got all that residual silver epoxy that's got to get scraped out of there. And when you do that, it's called collateral damage. You have little bits of foreign material that goes all over the place and you got to clean those out. And then you have to carefully dab down another little squirt of epoxy, place it down manually, and probably go offline to uh, some older manual equipment and try to, well, first cure it. So that's another thermal cycle for the hybrid. Then go wire bond it, then go inspect it. And if you're in a mill perf house or you're building a long mill perf 38534, which is the uh, uh, performance spec for hybrid manufacturing, you got to keep track of all that. You got to keep track of all those rework cycles and then it throws you out of the lots and now you got to create separate lots. So trust me, it's a nightmare. And a lot of it, not, not all the time. There's other reasons you got to <laughs> remove and replace components. They get in backwards or they're cracked or whatever. But I would bet on a Pareto chart, reworks due to... Um, uh, bond, you know, damage to the, the chip or the mimic um, and just, you know, wire bond related no sticks uh, is, is a big portion of uh, wire reworks and, uh, and die reworks. All right, so that leads me to resin bleed out. Now, this has been a problem for, for a long time. Um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, everybody moved from eutectics to uh, epoxies. Um, and originally they were notorious for their outgassing problems. And that's when uh, test method 5011 came on the scene to try to put some controls in place for that. But the resin bleeds out. And if it doesn't get on a wire bond pad, no worries. But if it gets anywhere on or near a wire bond pad, it's for starters a violation uh, in the mill specs, but the wire is not going to stick. Or you're going to turn up the power and try to wire bond through. And neither one of those is good. So if you look closely at any uh, silver epoxy fillet, more than likely, at least within a mill or two, 
you're going to see some some wetting some discoloration and that's resin bleed okay so i don't know if it's capillary action that's drawn some of those resins out um, i'm going to maybe explain that a little a little better here in a slide or two but uh, that's a big problem and then also uh, you, you're not necessarily going to see it, at least not with the, the naked eye. Okay, here's a good example. This was some kind of uh, phase shifter or what, I don't know what the unit was, but here's some silver epoxy. And look at this. I mean, first of all, this is a violation of uh, Mill Standard 883, Test Method 2017. In uh, uh, this paragraph, you're not supposed to put a wire bond within five mils of the epoxy. Now at the JEDIC meeting a few years ago, I asked the 13-5 uh, the chairman, you know, he made a big point that's got to stay in there. Everybody's like, why five mils? Well, they had a major problem. This was a big company at the time uh, with no sticks. And it was because of wires, gold wires, being bonded onto the resin that they couldn't see and then lifting up, unfortunately, in some of their customer products. Uh, but you can see here, it's kind of funny. Look at the squash out on this wedge bond right here, 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 not a big deal, but right here by the a fillet of the epoxy, I know the automatic wire bonder was cranking up the power to bond through the contaminant that he couldn't see. And that, that's a problem. All right, so here's just looking at an IC chip from an angle. Um, you can see the nice silvery uh, fillet, you know, portion of the way up the side of the chip. And um, no problems there. I don't see anything wicking out onto the bond pads. So we plasma clean. Just about everybody, and actually before wire bond, would plasma clean. Most people are gone plasma clean. And I'm not saying there's, there's any problem with that. I mean, there's some, some good um, argon recipes out there. But argon is inert. It's like, uh, tell people it's like, uh, you know, power washing your deck. You're just knocking atoms all over the place. But plasma, most gases, if uh, sometimes they call it the third or the fourth state of matter. Solids, liquid gases, you pull a vacuum introduce RF energy and you create a plasma, very aggressive uh, cleaning. But argon, you're just ablating material off the surface. Nothing gets oxidized. Okay, and argon they use in sputtering chambers. They uh, bombard a, a target with uh, inner argon atoms. Uh, oxygen, on the other hand, chemically combines with the organic contaminant. So if it's resin that you can't see, or it's something that's outgassed, or wherever it comes from with, with oxygen, you're going to combine with it and then suck it out in the plasma cleaner. And my experience has been it's a far more effective uh, way of plasma cleaning. So here's kind of a picture left and right. This is kind of the uh, the, the before and after shot here. But uh, a conventional uh, plasma treatment, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes in, in a chamber, maybe it's only five minutes of actual cleaning. You should be able to easily uh, clean up 50 angstroms, maybe more of, of, of organic contaminants. Um, and, if, and that's usually in the downstream, most wire bonders put the uh, unit in a downstream plasma clean. But you can get a little more aggressive if you need to. So outgas volatiles from the cure oven, um, residuals on the substrate. I've been involved in a few jobs there where nobody could wire bond to anything. And that's because the way the supplier shipped them in and or maybe they got repackaged in the factory and there were some residue on the uh, Teflon boards or on the ceramic boards. Um, even plating, you know, if you don't clean the, um, Lee, Lee was talking about Enapig. 
Well, you know, pigs supposedly wire bondable and solderable, but it takes a lot of work to get good at wire bonding the ENA pig. And one of the issues is cleanliness coming in the door uh, from residual plating solutions. And you know what really cleans that up? Like, uh, unbelievable, is just, just a good oxygen plasma treatment. So, um, uh, or if you do any kind of soldering. So, uh, there's, there's a role for oxygen plasma. Now, if you invoke that after your silver diatach, well, then you're going to turn the epoxy black. You can see here, it looks real black and looks terrible. So, so what? <laughs> I guess uh, is the name of the talk. But black epoxy, it's uh, when you first go into the plasma cleaner, the, uh, the oxygen plasma will ablate away the organic. And then you're going to oxidize the silver flake. It's 70% silver flake. So below like 200 degrees C, you're gonna form uh, uh, this oxide of silver, which is black and copper. So what causes resin bleed? Well, um, it's, it's basically, you know, separation. Now this usually shows up after it's been cured and, and maybe is sitting on the stage of the wire bonder. Sometimes it happens before you even put it in the cure oven or you see it after you pull it out. But you're, you're separating out some of the resins that weren't reacted as part of the cross-link that, that occurs. And for some substrates, you know, the theory is the porosity in the substrate actually draws the, uh, the resin out. So, um, Bleed out may occur after the epoxy suspense or after the cure step. Um, and it seems to like come and go. It's batch to batch related. Um, it looks kind of shiny. I showed you some pictures of it. Um, but it often goes undetected and just frustrates wire bonders because you can't see it. All right, sure everybody recognizes this uh, picture. Uh, maybe not. Actually, this part of the white paper was written by Phil Schusler. He's a friend and colleague. Uh, he's, a, he's a great polymer chemist. And I got a real good uh, explanation in the white paper, which I think everybody will get a copy of through IMAPS. If you don't, it's on my website, free download. But basically, that's what um, resin looks like via gel permeation chromatography. And the, these pictures have been around for a while. Now, a typical system we all use, and I'm not knocking 84-1, uh, but even now, according to Henkel in their MSDS sheets, this is the amount of silver flake and a bisphenol resin um, and some other stuff I can't even pronounce, but it's a pretty good range. And so, that might explain why there's a lot to lot variability. Uh, no bleed versions are available. I don't know what they do to make them no bleed, but I suspect they tighten up on some of those uh, ranges. Um, but it gets a little complicated, but when you see the bleed out, it's because all the resin didn't get used up. And there's this thing called steric hindrance, which I'm not gonna attempt to explain right now. Um, 5011, when it first came out, tried to tighten up on that. There was a little pushback from industry. So in any event, um, you want to be able to see it. So uh, fortunately, last few years, um, BAEs developed some technology um, to use a, a blue light attachment to a conventional scope and take this technology from um, out of the FA lab onto the production floor where it can really be of some benefit. Uh, and they, they've since gotten a patent for it. And um, uh, just nearby uh, from, from Nashua there is in Lowell, Mass, it's a company called Forgione uh, Engineering. So it's, a, it's kind of a startup, I guess. I love their um, data sheet. 
and, and, the, and the flag there and everything. It's it really, um, at full disclosure, I don't get any kickbacks or anything from sales here, but they have a product out there, the Universal Multispectral Fluorescence uh, Microscope. And so it turns out polymers, uh, most of them in that blue wavelength will fluoresce. So it makes it very easy to detect it. So either with a blue filter or a UV filter, you can get surface contaminants to kind of light up under the microscope. And it's amazing. And I've seen it firsthand. And, and I first learned about this at um, a conference I run called uh, CMSE, Components for Military and Space Electronics. A fellow from uh, a BAE there, Tristan, gave a real nice talk. So this is cut and paste right from his presentation with uh, uh, permission. We want to learn about CMSC. It's right there. Here's a typical transmission line on, on a Teflon board. Now, you look at that trace, that's everything you notice with companies. When they're doing a lot of burnishing, you need to get better at cleaning. But this trace is where I want to land a ribbon bar. All right. In a conventional scope, I can't see it. I put it under one of those uh, scopes with a filter and it lights up like a Christmas tree. So the, ri the ribbon's not going to stick here. So you can visualize some of the uh, organics, the resins, when they bleed out into the wrong spot and other organics, not just from uh, uh, epoxy uh, bleed out. Uh, using a filtered light and a filter. And so if you want, I can get you a copy of that paper um, or just talk with the folks at uh, nearby there, Fort Forgione Engineering. So, um, you know, it turns black. My thing is, uh, so what? Let's start looking at uh, maybe using oxygen more as a, as a treatment. But the process engineers, quality engineers, got to do their experiments, got to do their homework, because even though I, I feel this is a, a good thing to do, uh, the oxygen will oxidize other surfaces. But in most microwave units, a lot of it's gold on gold. And so what if some other things oxidize? But maybe, maybe that's an issue. Uh, the other thing I heard from... Uh, when, when epoxies go black is, you know, it, it almost looks like maybe if you touch it, something breaks off. So, you know, you don't just change your process, but um, now that we can see it with the filtered light, you know, that, that's a big uh, step forward for our uh, business. And if you want, you can just uh, take uh, that unit where maybe the, the epoxy's gone black, Give it an argon treatment and a nominal bake out, and you're right back to uh, kind of a matte, silvery uh, appearance. So, um, this is the white paper that uh, will be uh, in, in the notes, I believe. And I want to recognize Phil Schusler, who's gave a real nice explanation of the chemistry in the white paper. And that's a link to, uh, to my website where you could download it if. Uh, if you need it. So uh, with that, um, I'm done. So thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Tom. It was a great presentation. Um, we did have uh, one question come in. Um, for the aerospace industry, is it mandatory to use gold inter interconnects uh, over copper? Uh, could you repeat that? So for the aerospace industry, is it mandatory to use gold wire bond interconnects instead of using copper? Uh, no, but within the hybrid community, I don't know of anybody that's moving in that direction, but in the monolithic community, single chip in a package, and there's a lot of people out there, there is a push to start using copper. So some companies like TI, maybe Xilinx, I don't know, you gotta go to, uh, uh, it's, it's all discussed in 13.2. 13.2 in the JETA community, there are QML suppliers that are moving to copper. 
they have a big uh, two, three year old task group trying to update 883 to accommodate copper. See right now, I don't think they put it in there yet, but it's coming up soon. If you go to test method 2011 and 883, there's no minimum values for copper. But as Lee mentioned, the rest of the world's going there and they're going there for cost. When you're building a big honking microwave module, trust me, the cost of the gold wires so far down in the noise level, it's not an issue and people are used to it. They're, I don't see in, in relatively low volume mill products, any big drive or push towards copper. Okay. And we have another question that came in. Uh, when would argon plasma be recommended over oxygen? Well, they're both good. And, and I, again, I, I don't suggest anybody should throw away argon, but you would go to argon if you had something in the unit that, that you didn't want to see oxidized. Now, in most units, there's, you know, there's still aluminum at the bond pads. But an oxygen treatment isn't going to oxidize that any further because aluminum self passivating. But, you know, and then you could also look at a mixed bottle. When I was in Philadelphia at um, Warren Marietta at the time, later Lockheed, Valley Forge, we used to use a mixed bottle, like 3% uh, oxygen in argon or maybe even 90-10 or just incorporate the oxygen with the argon. But the argon is just knocking atoms around. That's why the inside of the oven gets, gets contaminated. And you don't clean and keep up with that. And you gotta watch with argon because you're sputtering. So, you know, you could be sputtering uh, fluorine compounds around or, or sputtering, uh, if, you're, if you're loaded with a lot of sort of solder joints, you could be sputtering tin and lead and other harmful uh, contaminants. So, I don't know, hopefully that answered it. Yep, I think so. Um, uh, one more question I saw come through, Dave, if we have time for it. Right, please. Um, in the mixed gas cleaning, is it a mix of, phys uh, of physical ablation and chemical cleaning? Well, we're, we're talking now. We talk plasma cleaner, especially in a wire bond application. It's usually done in a downstream mode, and a lot of people come out of the wafer fab. They hear plasma, and they're like, "Don't get that anywhere near my stuff." But in a fab, it's it's a lot higher power. It's used to strip oxides and take away photoresist or whatever they use it for. In the wire bond, it's it's just really there to clean up those, uh, honestly, 30, 40, 50 angstroms of surface contaminants that either maybe bleed out, even resin bleed. Now, if you see resin bleed, it's thick enough you can see it without a microscope uh, blue light. That's pretty thick. So you're probably going to have to do multiple treatments before that cleans up. But it, it's a, a microscopic cleaning difference between argon and oxygen. One is just ablation, more or less. The other is the oxygen has to combine with the organic, which is carbon. And then you produce CO2 and CO, which has to be safely exhausted. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're kind of running over here on time. But uh, anyways, I want to thank the speakers. If anyone has any questions, uh, we'll be providing their contacts as Tom did here. I guess I'll... Uh, Pass it back to you, Dave. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate uh, having your presentation. And this uh, brings us to the end of our session for today. Thanks everyone for attending. It's our first virtual technical session extracted from the what would have been the symposium in May on May 7 for this year. Uh, please keep in mind our schedule for the next uh, virtual events that we will have in October and November. We certainly appreciate the fact that everybody has participated and the questions and the participation, especially of Terry, Lee, and Tom as our speakers for this session. Tom did point out an important point, and that is that IMAPS New England chapter runs 
as an all volunteer organization, which is true of many IMAPS events around the world. So uh, thanks to everybody who's participated. Just want to say as a reminder, our next virtual event will be our chapter technical meeting for October. It will be held online with Zoom October 27 at five o'clock. Eric Perfecto from IBM Research at CNSC in Albany will be the speaker. And his topic, 2.5D and wafer level packaging explained. He has uh, considerable current involvement on HIR and uh, AI applications, uh, heterogeneous integration and, and road mapping for packaging. You will find our schedule for these events will be posted with updates if there are any on the chapter website, which is www.imapsne.org. And uh, everything we're showing here is Eastern time zone. And if there are updates, you will find them on the website. Matt, final comments? I think we're at the end. Oh, you're muted. Oh, yep. I'm on you now, yeah. Uh, just thanks for everybody for coming out today and taking part in this. And uh, big thanks to our speakers for presenting. And again, to Dave and Michael for all the hard work you guys have put in. Uh, appreciate it. We need to add one more, and that is to Lee as the session chair. Lee was the first to have as a session chair for the uh, what would have been the symposium in May. Lee had his session organized and submitted first, uh, uh, did it very quickly. We certainly appreciate it. And the quality of the presentations we have in the symposium simply seems to go up and up each year. Great to see. Thanks, Lee. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.